Michael Jackson's Thriller Album. Stories in the Room. This is Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room. Join film composer Anthony Marinelli, who programmed synthesizers for seven songs on Thriller, and a and veteran film producer Stephen Ray, who assisted Quincy Jones and was in the studio every day with Quincy and Michael. Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room. I'm Anthony Marinelli with my longtime close friend and co-host, Stephen Ray, bringing you the real stories directly from the talented people in the room with us during the making of Thriller, the greatest selling album of all time. Did you use any special equipment like on custom stuff when you're doing Thriller? I'm curious. And then also like how it's evolved the whole songwriting and, and song production um, process then compared to now, like, you know, we all had some specialized things and did you use it on Thriller? And then also how has it changed to now in your view, or is it, has it not, is it all just still music? Yeah. Okay. Well, those are kind of two different things. Uh, do you want to, do you want me to geek out on some custom stuff from the time? Yeah. Let's go for Remember it. Remember Thriller was pre MIDI, wasn't it? Sir, correct. You know what I mean? I, yep. I actually have a couple, uh, I don't have them right here, but I actually have a couple, believe it or not, CV to MIDI interfaces. Uh, there was a time where, wow. where MIDI was the, was the odd dog in my setup. You know what I mean? Uh, um, yeah. Everything from my, from my Jupiters to my, to my emulator at the time all had, and if you notice, this is uh, this was customized by Cooper, so there were on you know extra envelopes put on there, so I didn't have to listen to uh, the emulator looping. I could just use just the attack. Uh, oh, you have a custom. So that's the original one, right? Yes, there. that's the emulator one that was used on on Thriller, and um, all of my keyboards had uh, a CV ins and outs. You know, I mean, you know, especially CV ins, the Jupiters. There were eight CV ins and, and CV outs so that I could play more than one keyboard uh, from one keyboard. Am I making sense? You, back then you were Absolutely. doing that? Absolutely. Um, yes, I remember. Wow. It wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. You know, I had these polyfusion polyphonic keyboards that had multiple, that had eight CV and gate outputs. And I would be able to plug them into all these different synths. Oh, okay, so here's a geek question. Was it serial MIDI or parallel? Because that was always the problem, I thought, initially, because like parallel would be good, I guess, because they would all get the message at the same time and they would be like not delayed from each other. What I'm talking but, about is before MIDI. So you were doing MIDI before MIDI? Well, yes. you know, it wasn't MIDI, it was CV and Gates. I had a black box made where I could plug in all of my synthesizers, all of this CV and gate inputs. Now I see it. The emulator to the two Jupiters. I see. To the Polyfusion. And then, and also the outputs of my sequencer, my MC4 that you saw, or keyboard. Right. And I could control with this guy oh. who was playing what. Can you explain right. that one? Sure. I would, you know, one of these knobs would be the source you know, which keyboard or sequencer it was coming from. And then I could tell it which synth to play. So I could have it play multiple synths at once. Oh it was my. just a thing you... that the uh, uh, Ed Simeone, my guy in Toto, you know, together with Dirk Schubert, wow. our sound guy, just rigged up this huge switcher for me. You yep. guys talked about it. You you said, let's do this. Yeah. And how, how did no, that happen? You know, it just was... Uh, um, you know, I could play from one keyboard. I could play these different, you know, these different synths. But you had to unplug every time you wanted to switch from the, playing the emulator yeah. to a, playing a Jupiter. You had to unplug sixteen cables, and and right. with this, right. <laughs> I could play multiple keyboards at once before MIDI. Yeah, I've never yep. seen anything like. I I mean, I had which one is it? This guy. But these are like off the shelf things. I don't know if you like this just allowed me to interface with Korg, which has like different gates and triggers, sure. you know, this is this is a uh, for pitch to voltage. And then there's another one I have up here that does keyboard control voltage, you know, and gates and triggers. Sure. But 
this is just one at a time. You're doing, you're like 10 times more advanced with eight back voices, then. You know? Yes. Wow. I remember. I would love to see <laughs> that. <laughs> It actually, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, the yeah. other box I, I had here, it was the same way with, if you remember, everything was um, the way we saved data. You know, everything was to cassette, right? The Lindrums right. were all, you know what I mean, would be cassette. Oh. The, uh, all the yeah, synthesizers sure. were saved on cassette. So instead of switching yeah. those, my micro composers, you save the data to cassette. So instead of just switching right. those cables... I would hook up everything all at once to this little black box that, you know, a, a guy named Ralph Dyke, you know, and guys like Roger Lynn would help me build. Yes. And then I could just select who am I saving? Who's the data coming from? Or who's sending this? Where's the sync coming from? That's oh amazing. Goodness. That's amazing. These, Especially back you know, then. These black boxes that no one made them at the time, but, you know, and these guys would go, you know, that's 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 you're asking for a lot. That might cost like four hundred and fifty dollars, you know. <laughs> Here you go, you know. I do this for a living, you know? right? Right. Do you still have the data? I do on some of it. Yeah, none of it is, you know what I mean. I wouldn't even try to get it up. But the one, uh, um, I would the one I used with Quincy a lot. The thing I want to show you because we were talking about your doctor click back there. Before there was Dr. Click, right. um, my friend Ralph Dr. Dyke, Click. who did the original design of the first microcomposer, uh, David Foster introduced mm -hmm. me to him. He was a fellow Canadian. He, um, you know, I was in a band. Uh, I was in a band where the drummer, my brother, you know, wouldn't play to a click track. You know, I was trying to get into all right. this <laughs> stuff, all these sequencers <laughs> and stuff. And, uh, and, and Quincy, even in those days, it wasn't, it wasn't always done to a click, you know. He hired these world class nope. drummers, you know, JR and my yeah. brother and stuff. And these guys had impeccable time, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of right. drummers, like my brother, absolutely hated playing to a click track. So I had to, I was trying to use this stuff. And, and Ralph did this design. I don't know if you could see it, but it was a sync box. Oh, wow. You yeah. know what I mean? It was an FSK sync box, and uh, I could tap. I could tap quarter oh notes. Gosh, I and remember click, this. A, did you click yeah. create a click? Yes. And memorize so, or I could tell live. Yeah. It worked amazing live. It wasn't like jerky or anything. Um, I use this a lot with Quincy, where uh, um, just Boy. after the fact to come in after the fact with the machines. This is how we did State of Independence with Donna Summer and stuff like that. Oh wow! I'd plug in a click right. after the fact and. You know, the Dr. Clicks, as great as they were and as wonderful as they were, they didn't do this the way this did it live. Well, there's a recorder. Like, we used to isolate the kick drum, and we could get that pattern. Go. But, you know, you couldn't get everything. It would record it, you know, and you could you could mask with it. So you could mask out all the other drums that were bleeding on that mic, right? But not, like, I don't remember that you could do a – no, I mean, not that I know of. You could do a manual click. Yeah. But you could just get in there. But we did a little bit with the Synclavier that way. We'd we'd record it and then fudge it to ear. Kind of like you, but yours has just got a feel thing to it. It's yeah. much quicker. Yeah. But it so is your brother's time and then your time on top of it. Yeah. I mean, right? with this, you're Manual. able to just plug in any click. I mean, you could go out there and just do a cowbell, play a cowbell along with the drums. Just play along and nail it. You know what I mean? Punch right. in if you needed yeah. to, but right. nail it. Listen to the kick and snare. And, and just nail a, a cowbell part playing quarter notes throughout. And I could plug that in and live, it would drive my Lindrums, my sequencers, everything would follow along beautifully. Okay, but how did you get it to like, well, the Lin was like a 48 clock or so. How did you convert it to that? That does that too? It has output clocks? That's that's all it is, is, is uh, FSK, right. time base. Those 48K or 24, yeah. I could select it right here. Boy, you're bringing back memories, man. <laughs> That's all it did. This didn't output MIDI. This didn't output any kind of MIDI clock or SMPTE or anything like that. It was strictly for FSK machines. Like just one at a time or multiple? Uh, you know, you could mult it. You know, you could mult it. But uh, yeah, just one time base at a time. Mm -hmm. One time base. Right. And just to show people, this is like modern where you can get like four different time bases at once yeah, but, and it's MIDI. Right. But... 
when you think about it, Steve, it's not a you know, big deal. There's four of them, but it, like it was equally advanced what you were doing back then. And I think having to use your imagination more and add your feel to it and all that, I don't know. There's something kind of beautiful about it. Just it's, it's got a human, you know, every, even what, like, that's what I notice about your stuff. Even when it's like synced up stuff, it has like a human feel to it. And I just like, cause that's, it's the person yes. who does it. You know, it's like, yeah. I used to ask like, why do, why does, why do Mozart's melodies work so well? And it's like the teacher would tell me, cause Mozart did it. And I'd never, I go, that's not a good answer, but <laughs> it kind of is the answer that I've had to live with at this point in life, it depends who does it. And the way you managed all this technical box stuff, because when you listen to human nature, it doesn't sound technical. No. You know, and all the stuff you touch doesn't sound tech. It doesn't sound technical to me. I didn't yeah. even know you did. I thought you played everything sometimes. I mean. Well, no, and human nature, by the way, they, that was, uh, um, you know, that started off with the Lynn drum with a Lynn LM1 sync to my micro composer. So I didn't have to deal with any of that. Yeah. You know, we were able to, we cut it to a click. My brother, Jeff overdubbed on it. I overdubbed my, my Rhodes part wow. on top of that. Uh, um, but what was great was when it was time to do a sequence, like the arpeggiation at the front, it just sank right up. We were, we were ready for it. You know, Bruce, we recorded the FSK tone on a separate track and we're able to sync up easily. Join us for the next episode of Michael Jackson's Thriller album, Stories in the Room, with your hosts, Anthony Marinelli and Stephen Ray. Watch our extended interviews on youtube.com forward slash at stories in the room. Audio only interviews are available on all podcast networks. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Stories in the Room. For the latest news and links, visit the website, storiesintheroom.com. This podcast is produced by Christian D. Brune and David Wolf, recorded by Autovita Studios. Additional recording by Ben Rackless. Edited by Jay Spang and Sean Hedinger. Music by Anthony Marinelli and Stephen Ray. Michael Jackson's Stories